welcome to the lecture on energy indicators. An energy indicator is a number that characterizes a certain aspect of an energy system. And there are many different indicators and they can have different features. For example, indicators can be measured in different units. They can be economic indicators, energy or mass indicators, emissions, area use, indicators that have a temporal dimension and so on. Also, we can measure different aspects of the system. We can measure the yield, we can measure the efficiency of a process, we can measure costs or payback times. Finally, we have different system boundaries for those indicators. We can measure directly a process like the efficiency or we can measure indicators that characterize a plant as a whole like a collection of different processes or the entire life cycle of a certain installation. And to make this whole indicator issue a bit more systematic, we will use the quantitative systems approach to properly define the indicators and then characterize them based on their system scope and layer of quantification. At the process level, we have these relatively simply defined process indicators. For example, here, process PV modules with incoming and outgoing energy flows, and we can define efficiency and loss rate indicators as defined here. For example, loss rate would be the lost energy divided by the total incoming energy. You could do the same quantifications, but maybe not for energy, but for mass efficiency or for cost efficiency. You could also measure the lifetime of a certain product in such a process. For example, a car that's coming in, being registered, then being used for a certain time and goes out again. So that would be the indicator of lifetime of the car in that process, like a storage process or use process. So these things can be defined at the process level, measuring the stocks and flows and putting them into mathematical relations to characterize what's happening in those processes. Prominent examples here, for example, the cell conversion efficiency for PV modules, different technologies over time. So you can see you can define such efficiency indicators with certain parameters, like depending on the time when they're measured and which specific technology. We use process efficiency indicators already in legislation and also in consumer information. Most famous example here is maybe the energy standard or energy labeling for household and other devices where we define certain thresholds for use phase energy consumption. So the energy efficiency of the process of the use of the product and then based on different levels of energy consumption, we can rank the product uh, according to a standard A plus for very efficient or C or D for not very efficient. So these indicators only capture the um, energy use in this case during the use phase of the product, for example, a refrigerator or a light bulb. We have a similar approach to vehicles where we rank the vehicles according to their fuel consumption. Now this process works quite well for gasoline vehicles, for example, because most of the total emissions in the life cycle of a gasoline vehicle actually happens in the use phase. But it does not work well at all for an electric vehicle because the life cycle greenhouse gas emission from producing, using and recycling an electric vehicle very much depend on the carbon intensity of the electricity mix with which it is operated. So we need for a more complex product whose sustainability performance depends on the wider system context, also an indicator that has a wider system. And we will define those indicators by embracing life cycle thinking, where we go beyond the traditional focus on individual process and rather see the processes connected to forming the life cycle of a product. Again, why is this needed? Let's take another example, for example, a passive house. A passive house is a very efficient residential building. It ideally is heated by the heat of the people living inside and the waste heat of the electronic devices only. It's so well insulated that this waste heat heating is enough. Now, if that is true, and we can build such houses, then the carbon footprint of the construction material suddenly becomes the dominating factor in the overall emissions over the life cycle of this building. So when you have a very efficient use phase, 
The same with a very low carbon electricity battery electric vehicle, then suddenly the production phase of those products or buildings becomes very important. And we can capture this shift of importance by extending our system scope and also including the production and potentially also the recycling stage of the products into our picture. And we do that using the method of life cycle assessment, which is a standardized method that guides you through the steps of actually quantifying not only the use of the products, but also their production and recycling. Important message here is that the life cycle thinking tells you that there's different scopes, different steps to be followed. So first we need to, of course, define what we want to study. So what is the product and its services that we are interested in? We would then, in the second step, perform the so-called inventory analysis. This is the compilation of all energy and material flows that are needed to build, operate and recycle the system. And of course, we would do that using the quantitative systems analysis approach that we have been dealing with in this course. Once we have quantified the total so-called life cycle inventory, so all the material and energy flows of the product system, we can characterize their environmental impacts. For example, we can calculate the global warming potential, the carbon footprint of this product, or maybe we can calculate the impact on toxicity. So how is a life cycle indicator quantified in practice? As said before, we would first compile all the energy material flows that characterize the life cycle of that product we want to study. So here for the case of a PV module you see that we would take all processes into account from silicon smelting to the manufacturing of the other materials to the cutting of the wafers and so on, module assembly, module use and eventual recycling. Also all ancillary flows like energy supply are also included in the life cycle here. And now looking at all these different process steps, we can now start defining the life cycle indicators. And for energy conversion devices, one of the most important indicators is the so-called embodied energy. Embodied energy is defined as the sum of all energy flows to the different production stages of a product. So here, the energy required to make the silicon, the copper, and so on, the aluminium and the glass. All of this is included, so it's not only the energy that's in the product, like chemically bound or so, but it's all the energy that was consumed during the processes of making that product. And the next big step from going to embodied energy to another useful indicator is to define the so-called energy return on investment, EROI. And this is defined as all the energy that the product will ever convert, the useful energy, divided by the embodied energy. For example, when we have a lifetime of the module of 20 years, and every year a certain amount of energy is being generated, then the total useful energy would be 20 times that annual energy. And this divided by the energy for making this product is then the energy return on investment. We will soon see a few examples for this number. So here the complete overview. We recall the definition of the embodied energy as the system-wide input of all the energy for the production and we define the total useful or usable energy during the lifetime EEL. Then we can also define the annual rate of electricity generation or useful energy gener conversion which is the ratio of total useful energy over the lifetime divided by the lifetime. Then you get the annual useful energy output. Energy return on investment, as said before, is defined as useful energy extracted divided by invested energy or embodied energy. And in a similar fashion, we can define the energy payback time as the time that it takes for the module or the conversion device to regenerate its embodied energy. So to supply to the grid the same amount of energy, useful energy, that was originally invested in producing it. And that can be calculated from dividing the embodied energy by the annual rate of electricity generation or 
energy supply else. This ratio gives you a time dimension and the meaning of this time is exactly the time that is needed for the product to generate its own embodied energy supplied back to the grid. The energy return investment differs vastly across different energy conversion devices. Many hydropower stations have probably the best, highest energy return investment because you build them once, you build a dam, and then you have potentially a very high energy turnover because if the dam has a lot of water coming through and for a long time because the lifetime of many hydro dams is very long. So energy return investment rates of up to 100 are not uncommon. Again, what does it mean? It means that the hydropower station throughout it in its entire lifetime generates a 100 times more energy than was used in constructing the hydropower station. And as we go down the list, we see that also many fossil insulation, oil and also coal have very high energy returns on investment. And as we go down, we see that for many renewable energies, these are one in the bottom, we see energy investment in general goes down. So the renewable energies often are not as high in terms of energy return investment as fossil insulation, but they still have an energy return investment larger than one which they have to have, otherwise it's more or less pointless to use those devices in commercial energy supply. And of course, with rising efficiency, these energy return investments, for example, for solar cells, will also increase over time. The next big example is the energy payback time and examples here for. Take-home message is that sometimes we hear from renewable energy critics that the devices we build today, the wind turbines and solar cells, consume more energy than they ever will deliver. That is not true. And in terms of energy payback time, it means, of course, that the energy payback time is shorter than the lifetime of this device. So for wind, it's actually quite impressive. The energy payback time for a wind turbine is now a couple, a few months, maybe four months or so. So here it says 0.26 to 0.39 years. And that means already after four months or so, the wind turbine has generated the electricity that was originally used in building it and build, building all the materials for it. So very short energy payback time. And this means for the rest of the uh, 25 lifetime years or so, the wind turbine will be a net supplier of energy to the rest of the industrial system. Payback time for solar PV is longer, but usually is now in a range of two to three years with contemporary modules. So in extreme cases, we may have less than one year. In other extreme cases, elder modules may be 7.5 years, but typically now we are in a range two to three years. And this means after three years, the PV module is a net positive supplier of energy to the rest of the industrial system. Again, the full story is a bit more complicated. Of course, the energy payback time depends on the sunshine intensity. It depends on where you put it. The more sunshine you have in a certain region, the shorter the payback time because the more electricity you can harvest over the year. So far, we have dealt with energy indicators only. Now let's add costs to the picture. We need the costs to characterize whether or not we have a good business case for a certain renewable energy project. And the main costs indicator we have for energy conversion devices is the so-called levelized costs of electricity or other energy. So what does that mean? What is this indicator? It's a cost measure of the electricity generated by a certain conversion device and it factors in the different costs that we have for operating the device and for producing it and also for selling the electricity. So how is it defined, levelized cost of electricity? It's the ratio of all the costs that accrue over the lifetime of the asset divided by the total electricity that's generated over the lifetime. But, and this is very important, we discount future costs and future revenues. This is a common business case, so we can not know for sure whether 
we will have a certain electricity price in the future or an actual certain electricity generation. Maybe the asset will break before it reaches the end of the lifetime and so on. So the future is inherently more uncertain than the near present or the near future. So we factor in this future uncertainty by discounting future years by using this discount factor, discount rate R, and then the discount factor 1 plus R times the number of years from now to the future. And you can see this discount factor both for the costs, investment costs, maintenance costs, and also fuel costs in case we have a power station, for example, and in the denominator we have the energy that's coming in, so to say, that generates the revenue and discounting all these future costs and future energy and then dividing total sum gives you a measure, a cost measure of the electricity or generated or other energy supplied. This is commonly done, it's broadly used and it's important to know because once everybody sticks to the methodology, the cost factors we derive from it are actually comparable. And we see here a prominent example, maybe one of the most exciting trends over the last years, that slowly but steadily the renewable energy costs are entering the range of the fossil energy costs. So here you see examples for biomass, geothermal, hydropower, solar PV, concentrated solar power and wind onshore and offshore. And each of these bubbles here is a specific project, a renewable energy project from the real world with the cost factor here in US dollar per kilowatt hour plotted. And you see, of course, there is a range for different reasons. The uh, projects had different costs, maybe different land costs, different size, so different batch costs for solar modules and so on. But you see, most of these technologies actually have entered or are actually fully within the range, which is shown here in beige, which is the range of the fossil energy generation. Same plot, slightly different here from the IPCC report, and the same here, right? We have a wide range of costs, of course, for different renewable energy projects, but most technologies are well within the range of the fossil suppliers. So that means we now actually have, in most regions of the world, and for most renewable energy technologies, a strong business case for them. They are in most cases better in terms of environmental impacts than the fossil competitors and now they're also cost competitive. So this is a strong business case for promoting and deploying renewable energy even more in the future. Well that's all nice and sweet but here I need to issue a warning to you and the warning is that we are in a politically quite sensitive field. Renewable energy is entering a market that's dominated by other players. There are many vested interests. There's the fossil fuel industries, there's governments, there's all the citizens that have certain interests. And there's a lot of activity, a lot of numbers out there, a lot of organizations out there. So whenever you use renewable energy indicators, and that's my warning, always check where your data come from. Who has funded the work that led to these indicators. And is it a work that you really want to cite or is it an indicator that you really want to use? Ideally, you will get access to primary sources, for example, the International Energy Agency or to the peer-reviewed scientific literature. If that's possible, please use such estimates because they're much more credible than many of the numbers that are out there. In case you're in doubt, please check with experts, for example, your advisors or supervisors in the team you're working. Let's continue our ladder of indicators to the next group of life cycle indicators and these are the footprints. Footprint, literally speaking, is the impact you leave on the ground while you're walking. And we can translate metaphorically this footprint idea to a product. In this case here of the PV module, we would take the carbon emissions, for example, in the different production stages and sum them all up. This gives you the cumulative carbon emissions of producing, using and recycling a certain product, in this case a PV module. All these carbon emissions summed up together form the carbon footprint of the product. You can, instead of using carbon emissions, 
also maybe quantify the water use then you get the water footprint or the land use you get the land footprint so it's always the same picture you model the life cycle of a product or service in the different processes that contribute to the life cycle you quantify a certain impact or resource use water use or carbon emissions then you sum it all up to get the carbon footprint so this is the definition illustrated here and now let's have a look at the results again here from authoritative sources we see that we have very different greenhouse gases contributing to global warming and we see also that the different renewable energy sources are not entirely carbon free and this can be best understood when for example looking at a hydro power station let's say it's one with a reservoir then you have the actual power generation as a carbon free process because the water runs through a turbine so in that particular process no carbon emissions happen but you have emissions from constructing the dam in the first place so maybe million tons of concrete were used here and you often have methane emissions from the reservoir that can vary a lot so in this particular case you see even though the actual electricity generation process is carbon free so to say the overall life cycle is not because there were production emissions and there are other emissions from the use phase same of course holds for pv modules that can have very high impacts from production especially when the silicon smelting electricity and so on is coal-based electricity and also for wind turbines why they contain a lot of steel and plastics that has to produce somehow and somewhere when talking about life cycle indicators and especially footprints i need to issue another big warning and this is in systems thinking often the results completely depend on the scope of your system so the question of what is actually included big example here if you quantify the carbon footprint of palm oil biodiesel it completely depends on whether or not you include the land use change emissions if there were any from converting the primary forest to pristine forest to palm oil plantations this drastically increases the carbon footprint of your product if you add those numbers there and so you always have to check whether or not these are included in your footprint that's just as one example so when using life cycle indicators and especially footprints always make sure that you know what is the scope of the study what processes were included what basic assumptions were made when calculating if you're in doubt ask experts like your supervisors and your peers what system boundaries are suitable for this particular technology and so on and also check the quality of the life cycle assessments that you're using whether or not they're peer reviewed and whether or not they are conforming with the ISO standard now let's move on to some examples the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of different electricity generation technologies show a wide range of possible emissions and it's no surprise that the highest carbon emissions come from the fossil fuels because fossil by definition means it's carbon from the ground and the more carbon you have per energy like coal the higher of course your co2 emissions and if you have fossil fuels with relatively low carbon like natural gas you also have relatively low greenhouse gas emissions per energy or electricity generated but relatively low doesn't mean low enough so natural gas even though it's relatively low in carbon emissions per electricity generated compared to coal-based electricity it's still far too high to supply enough of the world's energy demand in line with the climate target that doesn't work so we also in the medium and long term need to move away from natural gas and switch to renewables which you can see here have a relatively low carbon footprint most of them but there are exceptions one of them is quite remarkable is the huge arrow bar or huge variation you see here for hydropower and the reason is that hydropower as i said before can have methane emissions from the reservoirs and the worst thing you can do is you build hydropower dam in peat land so in a forest area where there's a lot of peat in the ground when when you do that and you flood it by water you will have huge methane emissions and basic message is you shouldn't do this other renewable energy generations can also vary prominently again as so told before is the bioenergy 
whose carbon footprint can vary a lot depending on how the land use is factored in. So when we look at bioenergy a little more in detail, for example, we see here, depending on what crop you use, depending on how you cultivate the product and also where it comes from, you get huge variation in terms of the carbon footprint of certain bioenergy or biofuels. And there's no guarantee that just because it's a biofuel, it's also more climate friendly than the fossil competitors. That's not at all the case for many biofuels. Biofuel is renewable by definition because it's a regrowing source of energy, but the supply chain can be very carbon intense. The farming process, the harvesting, the processing that in the worst case, in terms of climate emissions, we would be better off sticking to the fossil incumbent energy sources. But of course, there's many good examples. Some are shown here. For example, sugarcane from Brazil is always a good example of an actually low carbon biofuel. And because the carbon emissions from different biofuels are so different, we cannot expect that any biofuel will help us reach a climate target, for example, in the transport sector. So what governments did, and this is actually quite clever, is to implement one of the first policy implementations of life cycle thinking by implementing or issuing the so-called low carbon fuel standard. Here's the example from California. Low carbon fuel standard is a regulation that tells you when you can sell your biofuel also as a low carbon fuel. What you have to do is you have to check what biofuel do you have, where does it come from, what it is made of, and what are the processing steps. And then there are typical benchmark values. For example, we know maybe that sugarcane from Brazil is very low carbon, so we would give it here a low benchmark. And we know that certain corn farming in some US states has maybe medium carbon, so we know there's a typical benchmark. So what you can do here, instead of doing your own life cycle assessment by putting all the numbers together, you take the average values from that table and calculate the simplified carbon footprint of your biofuel. And only when this carbon footprint is below a certain threshold, you can label it as low carbon and can sell it as low carbon fuel, for example, at gas stations or diesel stations. In the EU, it's similar. And here you can see reduction targets. So from 2018 onwards, a low carbon fuel must save more than 60% compared to the fossil fuels, gasoline or diesel, for new installations, new biofuel processing plants. 60% savings, life cycle savings. If you have a biofuel that emits more than that, so savings are less than 60%, you can sell it, but you can't label this as a climate-friendly fuel. So we have a situation here now where policymakers actually force producers to distinguish products based on their life cycle impacts. So this is a really nice and also very relevant and important implementation of systems thinking, life cycle thinking in climate policy. Of course, it makes things more complicated, but we will need to embrace that complexity when we really want to mitigate emissions at the same time enjoying the services that we have. So here is a compilation of the central messages from this talk. I will not read them for you. I will just make a quick break. So you can pause and then we'll continue to last slide, list some recommended reading on the topic here and thank you for your attention.